Okay, okay, great. Uh, bonjour, bienvenue, hello, welcome uh, to this uh, series in um, uh, the, uh, organized by the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Uh, my name is Elspeth Heeman, I'm the Interim Director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, and uh, very pleased to have you join us here tonight. We, uh, we present this um, as uh, part of a series on books that matter that is supported by the uh, McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, by the Eakin family, and uh, we are especially delighted to welcome here um, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Steven Pinker, who is, of course, a uh, McGill alumni. Um, uh, did a uh, degree in psychology here um, uh, before he uh, went on to bigger things. Um, Professor Pinker, Steven Pinker, says in his book, Enlightenment Matters, that he writes for people who like arguments. And I think that's why everybody who's come here is here, because we all like to argue. We like arguments, we like to hear arguments, we like big arguments about, uh, and lots of, uh, on big questions like, uh, what is reason, what is progress, and how do we get there? Uh, these are questions that especially interest, I think, us uh, at the Faculty of Arts, but not just on campus, of course, they inter interest all of us. Um, so, um, Professor Pinker is joined today by his sister, Dr. Susan Pinker, who will be moderating the question and answer period. Dr. Pinker is also an alumni of McGill, and I should say that uh, they are not the only McGill alumni in the family. Um, uh, Dr. Pinker did a, um, a psychology degree. She went on to uh, Waterloo and then uh, became a uh, practicing uh, clinician and uh, a professor as well at Dawson and at McGill University. And she has, as you'll have noticed, also herself two best-selling books that are for sale as well out uh, in the foyer. Um, very pleased to welcome both uh, Susan Pinker and uh, Stephen Pinker. Um, <laughs> there you are, sorry, uh, uh, to McGill tonight, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tom Schultz, who will be introducing Professor Pinker. Uh, Tom Schultz is a professor of psychology. He's associate member of the School of Computer Science at McGill University. He teaches courses in computational psychology and cognitive science, and he is a fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association. And he is, above all, the founding director of the McGill Cognitive Science Program here at McGill. Um, he, uh, his research interests include, as you'll guess, cognitive science and development, um, evolution, learning, relations between uh, knowledge and learning, decision making, problem solving, neural networks, and uh, agent based modeling, and is the author of uh, many, many publications, uh, hundreds of publications. Very pleased to welcome Professor Thomas Schultz to uh, introduce Professor Pinker. Thanks, Elspeth, for that uh, intro. It's uh, my distinct honor and a great pleasure to introduce uh, Steven Pinker today. Actually, I've known uh, Steve for a very long time. He was an undergraduate student in an honors research seminar that I taught here uh, many years ago. And uh, I could tell from interactions in that seminar that uh, this was a student who was destined for something really great. Of course, uh, at that time, it was very hard to foretell all of the wonderful things that uh, he has since accomplished. Academic posts at Stanford and MIT, and then a professorship, full professor at uh, Harvard with an endowed chair. Harvard, of course, being a very top university in the world. Harvard is so well regarded around here that people sometimes refer to it as the McGill of the South. Uh, sorry, Steve, but all our Harvard speakers have to endure that uh, joke. <laughs> uh, Steve's initial uh, academic research was in the areas of visual cognition and language. In visual cognition, he was interested in the idea of whether visual images are viewpoint invariant or not. I think he decided not on the basis of some uh, coherent evidence. In uh, language acquisition, he worked on both uh, acquisition of words and syntactic structures, resulting in two very influential books on uh, 
language uh, learnability and acquisition. These were in uh, 1984, 1989. It's also fair to say that Steve is one of the co-founders of a very lively subfield in psychology called evolutionary psychology. But I think uh, really he's most well known for his eight popular books. Uh, there was first The Language Instinct in 94, How the Mind Works, kind of a, a cognitive science book in 97, The Ingredients of Language in 99, The Nature versus Nurture Debate in 02, The Stuff of Thought in 07, A Sort of History of Human Violence in 2011, followed by a how-to guide on writing in 2014. And uh, the current book, of course, uh, on the Enlightenment that makes the case that uh, we humans are now or soon entering a period of enlightenment. Uh, for all this work, uh, Stephen has won uh, many prestigious awards, more than they've given me time to uh, list. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that four of them were in the academic area and five were public awards, all very prestigious. In addition to this vast amount of public work, he maintains an active lab with, uh, at Harvard with uh, current research projects. Uh, some of the topics are the same as the topics in his popular books, like quantitative trends in violence, biology of language. Um, but others are, are, other projects are on other more specific topics. For example, the role of common knowledge and cooperation. Uh, where I think we have some overlapping uh, interests, uh, genetic determinants of cognitive performance, and the use of very big data to study changes in the English language. In terms of uh, today's talk, I think it might be kind of tough to convince people that we are moving into a period of enlightenment. Most of us live in the present. After all, where else are we going to live? It's got to be the present. And most of us don't study history. But in an era of uh, Trump, Putin, Kim Jong-un, Brexit, threats of war, both nuclear and commercial, a possible rekindling of the Cold War, installation of a new war cabinet in the White House last week, um, continuing ethnic persecution in Myanmar, the uh, continuing war in Syria. Uh, if you look at several things like this, it does not seem like the best of times. But I think if anyone can, can convince us that we're headed towards an enlightenment, it would be Steve. He does meticulous research and constructs formidable arguments. And he explains it all very skillfully, both in popular writings and in his talks. And I think his points can be extremely telling, as when he reminded us that you know, after we tally up all the violent deaths, we should be sure to divide them by the total population, and to do this in each historical period that we're interested in. So I do recommend that we listen to his talk with an open mind. Please join me in welcoming Professor Steven Pinker. Thank you very much, Elspeth. Thank you very much, Tom. It's always a tremendous honor to return to my alma mater and uh, address my uh, former fellow students, my family, my, some of my professors. It's also a bit nerve-wracking because I can't escape the feeling that I'm being graded. Uh, <laughs> but in uh, time-honored McGill tradition, I might be at your office tomorrow morning uh, petitioning for a grade change, if necessary. <laughs> From time to time, we all ask some deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? How do we give meaning and purpose to our lives? As imponderable as these questions may seem, some people have very confident answers to them. <laughs> For example, morality is dictated by God and holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. 
Or problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. Or our tribe should claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. Or in the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Uh, many people are quite sure what they don't believe, but have much more trouble putting their finger on what they do believe. In the Enlightenment now, I suggest that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, the one that we associate with the 18th century Enlightenment. Uh, namely, that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. And as a result, they faded into the background as a kind of bland status quo or uh, establishment. Other ideologies have passionate advocates, and I suggest that Enlightenment values, too, need a positive defense and an explicit commitment, which is what I've tried to do in Enlightenment now. Uh, what do I mean by the Enlightenment? Uh, I refer specifically to four of its ideals, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason, with the realization that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion, including faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, the parsing of sacred texts. Reason, in contrast, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you insist that you are right, that other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. Human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable. Uh, cognitive psychology has shown that we are liable to generalize from anecdotes, to reason from stereotypes, that we seek evidence that confirms our beliefs and ignore evidence that disconfirms them, and we're overconfident about our knowledge, our wisdom, and our rectitude. But an important idea from the Enlightenment is that people are capable of reason if they adopt certain norms, including free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing, which leads to the second Enlightenment ideal, science. Science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible, that we can understand it, by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Science has shown itself to be our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. A recurring theme of enlightenment thinkers was that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable, just like other beliefs about the world. Science, moreover, provides not just technical know-how, but fundamental insights about the human condition. Naturalism, the universe uh, and its laws have no goal or purpose related to human welfare, with the implication that if we want to improve that welfare, we have to figure out how to do it ourselves. Entropy, in a closed system without input of energy, disorder increases. Things fall apart, stuff happens. Because there are vastly more ways for things to go wrong than to go right. Evolution. Humans are products of a competitive process which selects for reproductive success, not for well-being. As Immanuel Kant put it in his own words, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can be built. The third enlightenment ideal, I suggest, is humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings. Well, enhance human flourishing. Who could be against that, you might think? Well, lots of people. There are distinct alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, the nation, the race, the class, or the faith, to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same, to achieve feats of artistic or military or heroic greatness, or to advance some mystical force, dialectic, a struggle, or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Humanism is feasible because people are endowed with a sense of sympathy, 
a concern with the welfare of others. And this too is a recurring theme of the Enlightenment thinkers. Unfortunately, by default, our circle of sympathy is rather small. We tend to feel the pain only of our genetic relatives, our close friends and allies, and cute little furry baby animals. But the circle of sympathy can be expanded through the forces of cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas, including education, journalism, art, mobility, and reason. As soon as I enter into discussion with you, I can't say that only my interests are special just because I'm me and you're not and hope for you to take me seriously. Finally, we get to the ideal of progress, that if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. Now, you might ask, if human nature doesn't change, how could progress be possible? And an answer from the Enlightenment is that it's possible through benign institutions that allow us to deploy energy and knowledge to combat entropy in, on local scales, to magnify the better angels of our nature, such as reason and sympathy, while marginalizing our inner demons, our biases, our illusions, our tribalism, our thirst for dominance and vengeance. Examples of institutions that were brain children of the Enlightenment that we continue to enjoy today are democracy, declarations of rights, markets, organizations for global cooperation, and institutions of truth-seeking, such as academies, scientific societies, and a free press. So, 250 years later, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? Uh, if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not that well, because I have found that intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. <laughs> If you think that we can solve problems, I have been told, that means that you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, referring to the Voltaire character who declared, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, Pangloss, as it happens, was a pessimist. An optimist should believe that there can be much better worlds than the one we find around us today. But all of this is irrelevant because the question of whether progress has occurred is not a matter of having a sunny disposition, or wearing rose-colored glasses, or seeing the glass as half full, it's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they've increased over time, I submit that is progress. Let's go to the data. Beginning with life, the most